guess I don't need that. You can you can be right here. You can move this. You can do all that. Why are you so far, so close? What is up, everybody? We are live. We've been live for ten seconds. <laughs> like, why are you so close? Why are you so close? <laughs> How is everybody doing? What up? What up? Um, we are going to be answering the questions. This is the after the ride podcast slash live stream that we're gonna do a reboot, relaunch of it. How you doing, Robert? How you doing? Trying to get all this stuff situated. Uh, what's up, Aaron? Clab. Uh, so what we do here is that we just answer your questions. So we actually had some questions pop up uh, on the YouTube post. So tricks to pass your motorcycle test got 38%. So we're actually going to swap this over here so you guys can see what I see. Let's go up to up to that. All right. So tricks to pass motorcycle test, 38%. How to break in your motorcycle, 25%. 500 mile service what is your dream motorcycle what is more fun okay so that's kind of where we're at with that we're going to answer those questions but if you guys have any questions during the live stream let us know we'll try to we'll see if we can see them and we'll read them but uh, we're out of focus it shouldn't be out of focus i think you're i think you're blurry we're focused here you might be out of focus so you might have to sit back what i said you might have to sit back you're probably out of focus you're out of focusing us all. <laughs> you guys are going to see some lines on the screen real quick. So we're going to autofocus it. See right there. Alright. Cool. Alright. So here we go. Here we good. Here we goods. So, uh, the first one, it tricks to pass your motorcycle test. Um, shoot, do you remember when you took your test? Uh, <laughs> the, the, like the, the real one. No, like, well, the what? rider course or like the, uh, let's do the rider the course. Portion of it. Um, God, I don't remember, but it was, uh, I mean, it wasn't bad. It was pretty easy. We, uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was in yuma it was in yuma yeah that uh when i took my test back in yuma it was i i passed the practical really easy but the written test i really sucked at and that was all based on the fact and i failed it a few times to be honest that was all the fact that i didn't study for the test so first and foremost if you're going to be taking any test you should study for it uh so definitely study for the written the practical stuff uh we actually got some comments uh, underneath that poll is that uh, they're talking about that you're taking the test this weekend. The MSF, uh, learn your U-turns, tricks to pass, all these different things. And the one thing that I see from people that uh, don't pass the test is that during the class itself, they are super duper like, I don't really care and don't need to learn until like ex the last few exercises are like, oh crap. I don't, I can't figure this out because the first few exercises are clutch control, primary control, you know, how to turn the handlebars, how to turn. So those are the people that have probably been riding and they know how to do that. But then when it gets to the slow speed U-turn, tight turn from a stop, it's just like all out the window for them. And yeah. Because that's what's on the test. The, the Arizona DMV has it on, on their website, but I mean, it's a U-turn, it's um, a straight line weave tight turn uh tight right turn from a stop stopping that little box braking swerving and all those things and if you have improper um like an improper foundation of just practicing it on your own um it could really mess you up so basically what i was trying to say a uh, long story short is to pay attention in class because i some of you guys say that you're going to be at the msf course this weekend so definitely pay attention to the first few steps and build upon that um but then loosen up like relax like really relax just you're in a safer environment than like a normal parking lot and and there's no traffic so just relax and and uh try to have a good time be loose up top and then try to really grab the tank with your legs so that way your arms can stay loose that's another big thing counterweighting is a big thing so the whole u-turn and the test and the tight turn from a stop counterweight to the outside peg with your with your weight on your foot that would really really help uh, in terms of having to to turn itself and then look where you want to go. So look where you want to go, counterweighting and relaxing. 
that is like the three things that I think anybody should start really practicing out on the road, even um, not just uh, the MSF course and stuff like that. So those are my tricks, uh, counterweighting, relaxing, and then look where you want to go. So. Just don't overthink it. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's a controlled environment. They're there for you to pass. Like they don't want you to fail either. So don't, don't, uh, you know, don't be nervous just cause somebody's looking at you. You know, I mean, if you've, uh, if you've practiced, which you probably at that point have practiced some, um, you know, if you're not taking an MSF course, which you should, but if you're not, and you're just going to the DMV, you, uh, you would have ridden that bike at some point, you know, before you're getting it. So, um, that's the nice part about it. If you don't take the MSF course and you go get the permit, it's just a written. So once you have your permit, then you're able to actually go out and ride, which you can find a, you know, parking lot, or mm -hmm. if your neighborhood's pretty quiet, you can just kind of put around the neighborhood, which that's what you did yeah. initially. Yeah. Um, that, that's what I did too. So, um, and at that point you can really kind of get acclimated and comfortable to your bike. And then, uh, and then when you do feel comfortable, I think it's six months. Yeah. It's, it's, like it's that, not, that you have to put around and ride around before you need to take the test before you lose your permit. There's yeah. It's, it's not very long to be honest it's it's not long at all and the cool thing about taking the msf course especially here uh at ride arizona is that um if you do the e-course and you pass the e-course which you have to do anyways to get to right. class that counts as your written test now right. so like you don't even have to take a written test yeah that's the beauty of the msf yeah. you, you know you pay a little bit of money but they teach you a lot of different things that you won't learn just on your own unless mm -hmm. you're Subscribe to Dan Dan the Dan, Fireman Dan, Dan, YouTube channel. Dan Dan. Uh, <laughs> Dan Dan. And then uh and then you can go do it and then they kinda walk you through it. But if you don't do that, if you don't take an MSF course and you know you're learning you're learning on this channel and stuff like that and you feel like just going to the DMV you could take that test and we recommend an MSF course. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Or any type of uh motorcycle education, because I know some places don't have MSF, so um yeah, it it really just stay loose relax like he said uh, don't overthink it that's one of the biggest things with newer riders is that you just start overthinking like well i gotta start doing this because i was told this but now i'm lagging behind i'm worried 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 it's it's set up in a way that you don't have to worry about it too much um when it comes to well you're not going to take the msf at all you're not going to do anything you're just going to straight to straight to the dmv your best bet are youtube videos and at the end of the day that's not the best coach as much as I can talk to you guys and say stuff, it's it. You need to have like somebody showing you, um, unless you're really good at just listening to something and doing it. I'm not like that. I have to watch and touch, and I have to like do it. Have somebody tell me and point things out. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, some people are though. Some people could watch a video. That's the great thing about just having a motorcycle and having a you know parking lot is you can go make your own mistakes. And then you say, man, I don't know what I did there. And then you watch a video and you're like, okay, I understand. Uh, okay. And then you go try yeah. it again. I mean, we all have cell phones. You can literally watch a YouTube video in the parking lot with your motorcycle and then go and get on your motorcycle. And then if you mess up, go back and watch the video again and be like, oh, okay. You're giving cool. me ideas for That's videos. I, I need to start making videos where I do like, like little things like shifting. Like, oh man, I shifted wrong. Yep. Yeah. So I need yeah. to, I need to do shit like that. But yeah, I mean, you could do it. It's just uh, the MSF course is really, these dudes are pros. And then you're there and you get flooded with information and it's right information. How many YouTube videos are out there that are giving you wrong information? So you, Yeah, you'd be surprised. That's not a game you really want to play no. uh, unless it's Dan Dan the Fireman YouTube. <laughs> keep, keep plugging my channel. Yeah. We're on my channel now. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Never mind. You guys are in the right place. Uh, Amanda says, we're, we'll answer another question before we jump into the how to break in your motorcycle, uh, your new motorcycle. It says, uh, Aaron asked how to get over stage fright from being watched. Um, is that in terms? Let me scroll up. Actually, I got it right here. So it's a little bit closer. Is that in terms of, uh, like, in front of other people? Like, when you're doing the MSF or you're doing your test or are you talking about Matt being on camera again? <laughs> That's how I got it. How would you go over the fear of failure and stage fright from being watched? Okay. Um, taking the test. So, uh, just, just from my own, I know you asked for Matt, but from my own uh, perspective, I actually had 
uh, somebody um, uh, fail uh, the practical, but then you get an opportunity to retake it, at least with us, um, either that day or uh, at, a, at a time of your choosing that, that you can actually make. But a lot of the times they don't want to have people watching because they get a little freaked out and that's what causes them to, to mess up. So the second time they say, I don't want anybody to watch and that's perfectly fine. But you have to realize that if you're at the MSF, those people want you to pass. They're not there to judge. They're literally cheering you on. And I always give that opportunity. It's like, you know, if you want to try it now, they're not here to judge. Nobody's judging. They want you to pass. And you'll, be, and you'll see people, they'll stay and wait to watch that person go so they can say congrats. Everyone wants to leave the MSF with a feeling of, you know, you know everyone did a good job. You don't want to f be like, oh, yeah, you know, we had three people fail the class, but I passed. You know, and everyone's like, man, it was great. Everybody passed. Everybody had a good time. And that's kind of the atmosphere I try to, to push and, and put out there. Um but this was your question, so I took over. No, it's okay. <laughs> How do you get over stage fright from being watched? I uh, pictured, pictured myself naked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know you were going to say Yourself naked, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, myself naked. Yourself naked. naked. Yeah, I'm totally cool. There you right? go. End of story. <laughs> uh, no, I think, yeah, it's just like anything else, though. I mean, if you, if you get stage fright on a bike with somebody watching you, you're probably the type of person that gets stage fright doing anything in front of anybody you know that you're not maybe entirely comfortable with so um that it just takes a little bit of practice you know i mean you're not gonna you're not gonna just hop on that bike the, for the first time and then go take the test you're gonna have ridden it before um at some point so um if you go to the msf course you're with a group of people all those people might feel the same damn way uh you know they're, they're this is the first time they're on motorcycles and the last thing they want to do is uh you know feel embarrassed or anything like that so um if you're in the msf course you're with a group of people that probably feel really really similar to you if you're by yourself uh at the dmv taking this test then um you only have one person watching you yeah yeah and you've probably ridden that bike before because you probably rode it to the dmv mm -hmm. so um you know i i feel like there's probably not not too um not too big a deal for for people to feel that way um and once honestly you're not there to fail you're there to pass and once you once they say okay go ahead um kind of all that goes out the window and it's time to it's time to do it so um sing a little song or something you know. <laughs> any any sort of tips come some people have different tips for stage fright and there's there's certain ways to go around it and there's other people breathing uh, helps yeah yeah breathing breathing Deep helps breaths. yeah um drinking helps N not before riding not after Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, don't, <laughs> don't drink for the test. Drink water. Um, but yeah. Uh, but that oh, might yeah. help. Yeah, for, for no, that. No, just, uh, just practice a little bit. You know what I mean? Or a lot of it. Yeah, you should practice. And then uh, that stage fright thing's not going to really... It won't hang out for too long because when it's time to go and it's time to put the work in, you won't think about that anymore. Yeah. You think about just hitting the right lines and, and uh, you know, doing everything properly, so... Yeah, and, and uh, you have to think about the atmosphere that you're in, too. If you take the MSF and it's the BRC1, because I'm, I'm assuming that you want to take the test. So there, you're there for two days, two range days, and the MSF coach and the instructor, whoever, they want you to pass. They're not going to pass you just to get a passing score so that way you get on the road and die. They want to make sure that you know everything, and then they really do want you to pass. So just like uh, Chief Luf Lucifer says, uh, his MSF coach was a hoot. He cracked jokes all day and turned it into learning. Didn't even realize he was instructing you that way. That is, you only get that from a class. If you show up to the DMV, the lady may or may not care if you pass or not. So you're going to get a lot more instruction, and then you're going to actually get that atmosphere of somebody wanting you to be there to pass. Yep. So that's huge. Those ladies probably care. but eh, They might. Know. It's it not could, like you're paying them. Unless you know, it's like a Friday. It's their at job. Four. Friday at four. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> um, so we're gonna move on to the next one real quick. I see your question. Well, you know what? This is we're still on the the tricks to to pass. Uh, let's see. Uh, lights out. Hey Dan, do you think a closed faced helmet makes the test harder? No. Um, if, if it's in terms of, I didn't hear the instructor say something or the coach say something for the test itself, 
or the lady at the DMV, uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't make it any harder. Um, I like to practice like I ride, so I'm always wearing the same helmet. I'm not choosing a three-quarter helmet or a half helmet for when I go test and practice, and then I go on the road with a full face. So um, it, it's it's about the same. It's, it's, it's a non-issue on that point. Um, all right. So how do you brake in your motorcycle? This was uh, the second most requested out of 400-plus votes. Um, so how do you brake in a new motorcycle? So I'm assuming it's not like new to me, but it's actually new from the factory. So I'm going to leave that one to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's probably a lot of different factories probably have different, you know, different opinions or different policies. You know, if you read through the owner's manual and it tells you how to brake in your new bike and let's say it's a, you know, Ducati sport bike or an Indian or um, you know, there's so many different, different motorcycles out there that there may be different, you know, different ways to do it. Um, the, the consensus, I think for most motorcycle factory, um, you know, like Yamaha's and Indians and Harley's is probably to take it easy. You know, you don't want to just smash the throttle and go, you want to kind of, um, casually go through the gears, but you want to cycle the RPMs as much as possible. Um, in the sense that, you know, um, the last thing you really want to do is go out on the freeway and put it on cruise control and just keep it at that one RPM because you're only breaking in that part of the motor that part, and that's yeah. it. Um, so we sell, you know, we sell a lot of bikes at the dealership, the guys out of town, they need to take like, try to take back roads or, um, you know, try to, try to vary the RPMs and cycle through the gears as much as you possibly can. So, um, I know that when I brought, when I bought mine, you know, a brand new bike, I'll ride it really how I'm going to own it, how I'm typically, typically going to ride it. And that's not, you know, I'm not going to dump the throttle, you know, dump the clutch and, and hammer the, hammer the gas and, and just haul ass everywhere. I'm going to, you know, just casually go through it and kind of ride, uh, how I'm going to own it for forever. Um, and then just vary the RPMs as much as I can. So they talk about heat cycles, um, you know, right now it's July and it's hot as hot as hell out. So, um, you know, you probably ride around for half an hour, maybe to 45 minutes. And then, you know, by then that motor's really, really hot. It's as hot as it's going to get. Um, and then stop, you know, find where find somewhere to stop and hang out, grab a drink, um, relax, check your emails, whatever you want to do, but let that bike cool all the way down. Um, until it's you know as if it was just sitting for a couple days let it cool all the way down and then once it's there go ahead and fire it back up and then go ride for another half an hour 45 minutes uh, and then do the same thing so um right riding in town um riding up a mountain those, those would be great like riding up mount lemon yeah, be... constantly shifting gears and you're on the throttle, you're off the throttle, RPMs are up, RPMs are down, you're never using cruise control, you're never at the same RPM ever. Um, the only problem with Mount Lemon is you can 35. literally- <laughs> It's 35. <laughs> that, it, it, that, but you can go faster. Yeah, but yeah. The, the problem with it is it takes so long to get there and you've literally put 20 miles on your bike. Yeah, yeah, you know? unless so you live right next to it. if it's a 500-mile break-in period or it's a 1,000-mile break-in period, which I think most bikes are a 1,000, um, you know, that's gonna take a while. Mm -hmm. So you gotta you gotta ride around town and you gotta do stuff like that. And riding around town's fine. It just you know it kind of sucks. Yeah, you're stuck in traffic and stuff like yeah. that. But those are the big things. I know some bikes will say like zero to a hundred miles is a quarter throttle and nothing more. Zero to a zero to a hundred miles is a quarter throttle and nothing more. And then a hundred to three hundred miles is half a throttle. Anywhere between half a throttle. Or you know, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, And then 300 to 500 is That's quarter throttle. Is so three quarter hot, yeah. so restrictive. Nobody does this shit. Yeah. It, it, it's so three quarters of a throttle, you know, three quarters of a yeah. twist. You know, your full twist. And so 300 to 500 would be three quarters. And then after 500, you have that break-in service, and then boom, you're good to go all the way open and have at it. You know who does that? Who? Indian. <laughs> really? I shit you not. That's why you know it. <laughs> yeah. You know we, how many people that own an Indian that does that? Not me. No one. Not me. I never push my bike to 
to the <laughs> to the speed limiter. I know some people have done that on their FTRs. Um, I did but... it on your FTR. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> anyways yeah on the interstate <laughs> open road no nothing yeah it's all good yeah yeah safe oh yeah full gear oh yeah yeah okay in a bubble yeah on a track on a track yeah <laughs> very very controlled environment um but yeah so when um when indian came out that was the break-in period that's so and random we were just like ride it like you're gonna ride it <laughs> You just, just look at this the, shit. Yeah, man. It was like, oh, my okay, God. Okay, so only a quarter throttle for it's the first much, 100 miles. Yeah, it's BS. And it's what way too much thought behind fuck? it. Like, the idea behind breaking your motorcycle in is to hopefully not have to think about breaking your motorcycle in. You go out and enjoy it because it's a brand new bike. Yeah. And, you know, people freak out about it and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, just go out and ride it how you're going to ride it. Enjoy it. But just make sure those those small things specifically, you know, the heat cycles, try to stop. And most people on bikes are going to stop every half an hour to 45 minutes anyway. Yeah. You know, unless you're going like big trips. But if you're going on a big trip, your bike's probably broken in already and had that first service to where, you know, you can put the cruise control on or keep it at that same RPM for hours and it's not going to do anything. So that is... uh for the most part breaking that's your breaking that's breaking, breaking your motorcycle. Your motorcycle yeah um yeah that's I mean, that's so that's for like the engine and the reason why you have to do that is because like the fluids are like crap like they're not crap but they're like designed to like that, all preservative crap so yeah that, that fluid that comes with uh with the bike when you buy it new has some stuff in it that you know your regular like after your oil change you're getting a lot of that stuff out so a lot of like metal shavings and stuff like that you know it's going through the motor that oil's going all the way through the motor and it's it's breaking it in which yeah. means there's shit in there that you want to get out um because it's being broken in and that's why that first service is pretty darn important um to get all that stuff out get fresh stuff in and then you're golden like you're good to go so um okay. yeah yeah it's uh you know there's a reason behind breaking in your bike and most people are, are gonna do it properly yeah that's weird I, I don't, i've never heard of that for like a car no like they don't no it's just bikes performance yeah. machines basically yeah that's cool um so i mean on top of that i mean that's that's the engine and fluid and all that stuff uh if, if you have a new bike from the factory you obviously have new tires too so don't yeah, those are slick yeah they're slick yeah. so i talked about how to break in your tires and then the whole tire guide burnout um don't you could do a burnout to warm up your tires. Yep. You that's... really could. You move a lot of traction <laughs> off your <laughs> and tread off your tires. Breaking them in. Bra- <laughs> shooting, <laughs> shooting tire everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you could totally do that and warm up your tires that way. Yep. Create a nice little divot for those commutes. Um, but yeah, definitely don't like do a sharp right-handed turn out of the dealership full throttle. No, don't with do With those that. new tires. Yeah. Um, take it nice and easy for like the first 10, 15 minutes and then now the tires are warmed up and then yep. go ahead and do your thing. Um, that should be for like the first hundred miles or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. hundred miles is probably enough to scuff those tires up and make yeah. them real, real sticky. Sticky. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, yeah. Collab. Remember to buy blinker fluid. Um, so yeah, is the 500 mile service needed? We kind of jumped on that. That was the third question. Uh, it's needed because of the fluids need to be changed. All the metal shavings, yeah. all the gremlins and everything need to get out. Yeah, so yeah, there's that question. That 500 mile service is pretty important, or a thousand mile service. Yeah. It depends on the bike, but those those first services help in a lot of different ways. It gets that old stuff, you know, that that stuff with all the metal shavings and all that stuff, like the break in stuff, out of it, which is important because you don't want that stuff in your bike. And then it allows the dealership to go through it and make sure everything's, you know still working properly after these 500 miles of you doing it because nobody's nobody's ridden it before so yeah. um you know a lot of things loosen up um you know there's there's critical fasteners all around that bike that need to get you know torqued down or to make sure they're still torqued down because things loosen up on bikes so fast that you know that's important and then you know belt tension or chain tension all that stuff clutch Um, there's quite a bit and that's generally what every service every first service is about is them going through the entire machine making sure everything's breaking in properly and then um, you know nowadays everything's software based and it's all plugged into computers 
you know so, so like, you might have to get a software update you could get a software update you probably won't get a software update update that soon yeah um if it's you know a brand new bike that just came out but you never know um big thing would be like warranty wise if you um if you're having the dealership do your service and they can plug it into the computer and then it it essentially uploads to a server and it shows that you've done the service and it's been complete that way if you have a warranty issue at some point oh. it really helps enforce the fact that you have a warranty and you did your service yeah you know what i mean so there's a lot of gray area involved with warranties so it's helpful to be able to look back and say look man we did it you know like yeah, that service yeah. has been done it's been complete and it's good to go so that's another benefit to having them do it yeah For, you I could mean, still do your first yeah, service yeah. and stuff like that but like I said, there's a lot of gray area involved. They'd have to feel, they'd have to figure out whether or not your first service or lack of first service caused whatever issue it caused. Yeah. But I would uh, yeah, crashing into a car it was the service fault. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, the oils. Was. Yeah, <laughs> no. I, I if you buy a new bike, you're you're uh, and, and you're you're the type of guy that's gonna work on his bike uh, or her bike. You should have the dealership at least do the first service. Let them do the first one, and then you have at it for all the other ones. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just have them do it, and then I can change my oils, check my chain, do all that stuff myself. Yep. Did you make your appointment? Yeah. yeah. I saw you called. Yeah, I called. Yeah, I got my appointment. It's a Daniel Tamale. I, I, can't, I can't ride, though, because I'm, like, super close to 500. No, you can go over. I can go over? Yeah, 500 miles is, like, a, a, a baseline you and there's another thing with with breaking it in and stuff like that don't feel so so uh oh my god i'm at 496 miles i can't go anywhere until it's serviced that's that's not true well that means nikki and i can go ride then yep sweet you could totally service it what you probably don't want to do is go you know hundreds and hundreds over it but you a can a thousand miles no no that would not be good especially when the manufacturer says 500 yeah. Yeah. So that's not good. Yeah. Okay. Thousand miles is probably pushing it, but if you kept it under like eight hundred, you'd probably be okay. Okay. Well, then I should be good because I'm. Not, I put what this is gonna be five hundred miles in like three weeks, so I, I yeah. just have one more week. Yeah. So, so your thousand mile services. I mean, if you went over by eleven hundred or twelve hundred, or you went over by a hundred or two hundred for eleven or twelve hundred, you'd probably be okay too. So. Cool. So just around that area. Yep. Yeah, that's a ballpark. People just, people aren't going to – you're not going to roll up to the dealership and have exactly 500 miles. You could plan it. You're not going to, though. Have people done that? You're 20 miles away from here. I can trailer about eight of those miles and then ride the last 12 and make it exactly 500. Oh, do that? Do I get a bonus? No. No? Okay. Never mind then. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. I, th I wanted to get, like, a free T-shirt, which you got me for my birthday. Thank you for the t-shirt. I didn't wear it. I've been wearing the t-shirt. Yep. <sighs> Sorry. It's an FTR t-shirt too. Well, anyways, uh, we talked about the uh, service. These are the things that you guys wanted to know. So this is 500 mile service. Um, the next one is what is your dream motorcycle? And we actually talked about that just for a quick second. And I don't care if he's joking or not. <laughs> but he really wants this, <laughs> this bike right here. He really wants the RSD T Max by Roland Sand. <laughs> <laughs> he wants the RSD T Max. It is a very capable machine. Really good exhaust output. So he's got this nice backflow. <laughs> so he has really good engine stuffs and things. And I mean, this is what it originally looked like. That's a great job by him. He did a great job. <laughs> he really did. So um, that is his absolute 100% dream motorcycle. Nothing else whatsoever. Um, no. <laughs> so what is your dream motorcycle since I already have mine, basically? Um, Spoiler alert. I just told you mine. My dream motorcycle. Dream motorcycles. Oh, man. So... Name off the top three, like if you could have. I don't know if there's a top three. There's a there's a top one. Like he's a custom bike builder. It's not Rolling Sands as much as I love him. What about factory then? Straight factory. Okay. All right. Factory. Factory, and then you do your own shit with whatever options you have. Factory. And then we'll do your your fantasy. Dream bike. Would be. Oh man, this is hard. It's hard. Oh, the hard. chat the chat disappeared. 
Keep going. Um, thank right. you for letting me know that. What is your dream motorcycle? There we go. So, does it have to be still made? No, I mean, if it was... Are you talking, like, anything like like World War Two era shit? No. No, oh. it's not that. You want a Buell, don't you? No, I don't want a Buell. <laughs> so, I want a... Um, I think it'd be really, really cool to have, uh, you know, like an RD350. Like a, a, you know, I don't know what that yeah, is. So, I think it'd be... What I, is that? I think it'd be really cool to have... It's a Yamaha... <laughs> And it's a two stroke. It's a two stroke. So, you know, if you guys know like you know, straight that? Yeah, I think that'd be great. I think oh it'd be so my cool. Gosh. Um you know, I think uh That's what he wants. I would I would, I would customize it because I like to customize things, but I think it'd be so cool to have uh an RD three I mean it's a two stroke. And uh if you guys know <laughs> motors, there's two strokes, they sound incredible and they have this crazy power band that's like you hit the you hit the gas and it goes nowhere and then the power band kicks in and it's gone <laughs> and uh it's incredible and there's videos of people on rd350s um like smoking like jixer 750s are you serious yeah you should look up like rd350 versus sport bike or whatever and they're they're just it's it's really cool and i think as a fat like a factory bike as one of my dream bikes I, I would do that it's kickstart it's really cool <laughs> so if you guys don't know two stroke motors it's really hard for me to tell you that that's my dream <laughs> bike. that's your dream bike <laughs> it's one of them of man. all it's bikes really, really cool. of all bikes man yeah oh my gosh yeah i like it a lot so that's that Look up custom RD350. Oh, okay. I feel like you're looking at this and you're judging me so no, much. No, I'm not. I'm and, just uh, like you can't. You're gonna have to trail your bike. Oh, okay. It looks pretty good custom. Yep. Yeah. Let's go ahead and oh, wrong button. Look at that one. There we go. Yeah, that looks nice. That looks nice. Yeah. Ooh, I like the scrambler. There's some really really. That's cool a badass ones, scrambler. But they're wicked fast, like scary, scary fast. Um, because that that two stroke power band is just it's nasty. So. Um, I think it'd be really, really fun to have. Um, they're out there, you know, they're, and they're not overly expensive. I think it'd be really neat to to have one of those. Very cool. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that looks. It's like Some a bicycle. Some of those look pretty hideous, but I, yeah. I, I really like. I like the scrambler a little the RD350. bit. More like a flat track. Or they do like uh, Kawasaki made uh God, what was it like water buffalo? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, like is a eight day is like a H two or something like that. Um, where it was like a, uh, it was a big, big. Um, <laughs> it's a water. That is not, <laughs> that's not a water. Kawa, Kawa, <laughs> Kawa. <laughs> I don't know what they called it, but it was. Anyways, H two was nasty, and that was like a, uh, I don't know, that was like a five hundred cc two stroke bike. And you you would ride. Fast. You can't ride that out of town though. The RD three hundred and fifty. You're gonna have to. No, I wouldn't ride that that's on long in trips or something like that. I would ride that in town. Just just messing around, or I'd take it up the mountain or something like that. <laughs> but it'd be awesome. You, I'm serious. You need to look up a video of RD 350s versus uh, sport bikes, and they beat them like a really? quarter mile stretch. Yeah, quarter mile oh, drag quarter mile, stretch, yeah. just beating them. That's funny. Yeah, it's like a no. Like kickstart it's like <laughs> 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 it's like a weed whacker. So that is your dream bike. I think. Uh, well, yeah, from the factory. That from would the have factory, to be one of my and then you do your one own of my stuff. dream bikes, and I'd customize it like that black and gold one because that one was cool. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh. What yeah. about what about just bike in general? Now, like anything new that's out right now that you would like? Any new motorcycles right now? I'd take it FTR. FTR. FTR is wicked fun. Heck yeah, boys. It's FTR. So much fun. Right there. Yep. I like it a lot. It's so much fun. I like the look of, uh, I still like the cafe looks. Like mm -hmm. the Thruxton R, the 1200R. I really like the look of that. I like uh, um, the R9T, the BMW R9T. I like the look of that one. Some of those Ducati Scramblers I like. There's, there's, there's some bikes out there that I like. I wouldn't, uh, I just don't need them. I wouldn't buy yeah. one of those. But you know, RD 350, huh? RD 350 would be my my bike of choice. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's so cool! I'm old, man. <laughs> I have my birthday's before yours. Vintage June June Vintage. 14th. Um, but, but my dream 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 bike. Oh, here we go. Dream dream dream. Yep. 
is three uh, dreams. Yeah, yeah. So he's custom bike builder. His name is Maxwell Has Hassan. Maxwell Hassan. Hassan. Hassan Motor Works, I think, or whatever it that is. Sounds a little familiar. H A Z A N, I think. Oh, I was going to say Hassan. H-A-S-S- no, it's not quite like that. Hassan. I think it's Hassan. Oops. Motor, Motor works. works. All right. And Let's see what he does. His bikes are incredible. What the like heck? Like that black one in the corner. Yeah, let's go ahead and. Um, this one or this one? That one. So he'll take old like BSAs or old iron heads. He has know, like Harley really iron heads, yeah, really thin lines. And uh, he'll 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 make them like it's uh it's it's incredible. And uh, so I've been following this guy for years, and he's uh you know he's out of Los Angeles or something like that, but he builds bikes that are just they're amazing. That's my dream. Those are my dream bikes. That one is wicked. That's a Ducati. Um, Ducati. I wouldn't do that. I don't like. I like it, but I don't need that. But he does like supercharged crazy bikes, or he does. You know, I like the old, the old vintage style bikes that he makes not look old vintage style anymore. And so, like, yeah, those look all futuristic. Like those look amazing. super futuristic. Like that one right there is an iron head. That looks like a cafeteria. The second thing right there. That's like a what the f- 1969 Harley iron head motor. <laughs> so you guys can see it. <laughs> look at that thing. So that's, that's that's crazy. That right there is my dream bike. Maybe not that one, but yeah. you know, one of those. I, I really like taking your RD thirty or three fifty to him. No, like... no, I want my RD three fifty. I want him to make me something like that black one. Yeah, which I think that that black one with the full black fender is a BSA, and uh, yeah, that's what I want. Dang, that's my dream bike. Right I there. thought you liked Van Vans and like I do like the Van Van. I don't think I could put the Van Van on my dream bike list. No, so. yeah, so that's a bike that you'll just get because you can. Yeah, but so other RD than FTR, what would be your your bike? What would be your dream bike? 2012 Harley Nightster. 2012 Harley Nightster uh, VIN number. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that. Thing I don't is. know. I don't even remember the VIN number. Um, man, I don't know. I really like the FTR and. Every time I want to add something to it, it almost goes towards like a dual sport adding, like bags and yeah. and all that stuff. So, I mean, if I had to get in a bike, it would probably be like a dual sport, like a like an actual dual sport. Like an sport. adventure bike or a dual sport? Um, a Tenere versus... No, uh, not that. Like a DRZ? I might just... Yeah, a DRZ 400. Like, yeah. like uh, the baby brother of the, of the FTR where I have no problem dropping it, taking it off-road. That sounds like a 2012 Nightster. <laughs> that I took off road in yeah. the desert. <laughs> <laughs> you launched into bushes. <laughs> I launched in the bushes. Wow. Uh, yeah, DRZ 400 or maybe like a TW 200. I like, like the TW. The TW 200 would be fun. I like the TW. Um, but man, I don't know. Like, there's not much. Like, I've been super hyper focused on just the FTR mm-hmm. for like two years. Like, I didn't get a bike because I wanted that one when it came out as a 750. Yeah, it was the prototype, and then it came out as the prototype for twelve hundred, and I was like, hell yeah, I want that. And then this one came out, I was like, hell no, I don't want it because it looked ugly to me. And then I saw it in person, I was like, oh, okay, it makes sense. Yeah. And then I liked it, and then I love it. It's such a. I great want bike. some more of it. It's a really cool bike. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah, the TW two hundred is really fun. It yeah, really is too. Yeah, that was a good one because it's got a fat front tire. It's not like this super skinny tire, and that's the. It looks ridiculous. Like. It just looks. I like, <laughs> I like the fat front tire. Yeah, I like the fat front tire. Um, quick, quick uh, question, not an in-depth uh, type of thing, but what's more fun, dirt biking or street riding for you? Um, I didn't say and why. Just, just say it. I like dirt biking because you're out in the, I mean, you're out in the wilderness, yeah. you're out in the woods, you know, or I'm not like a, I don't want to, I don't want you guys to think that dirt biking, like, like, uh, you know, like motocross type stuff. I'm not into that, but like a dual sport, if I were to take a dual sport, um, you know, through the mat, like you go up the backside of Mount Lemon on a, on a dirt bike. You could do that on a TW easily. And I think it'd be awesome. You know, there's so much, there's so much wilderness that you could see. And if you could do it on a bike, I think that'd be, that that's the coolest 
for me. I would do that versus, uh, for, you know, street riding. Street riding's fun and all, but it just gets, you know, there's only so many times I could go through town, you know, or something like that. Yeah, so, there's, you're you kind of limited to streets. <laughs> I do, yeah, but I mean, some streets are cool. You do, you know, you could do, uh, you know, the 666, like Devil's Highway on yeah. the street. And, that, you know, that that kind of riding is probably awesome. You do, like, uh, Highway 1, you do Pacific Coast Highway. Like, that's probably, you know, yeah. the most incredible stretch of road for street riding. Um, yeah, I think of streets, I think of in town. So, yeah. So, on well, road, like, on road stuff. There's a ton of. Man, that'd be hard. I so bet now, you there's now a I'm PC... of the other way. No, I bet you there's a PCH version of a dirt road street or an off road. Might not be like single track or whatever. Yeah. It's a fire road. There's like Oregon, like, like through You're the mountains. Riding a and bike shit. on the beach in Oregon. <laughs> riding the you're riding a dirt bike on the beach. Yeah. What the fuck? That'd be. Yeah. You can do that with uh, the the FTR. RD 350. I'm not taking my RD350 <laughs> on the beach, man. Keep in mind. You could totally do that. You could totally do that. <laughs> I took sure. a Harley Davidson <laughs> off road. I know. Yeah. And it 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 looked as if you took it off. That's right, but you know what? I got an FTR now and yeah. then it has a clearance and I can go off road <laughs> <laughs> and not worry about cr- cracking anything or hitting anything. Oh, that's funny. Um dirt biking or dirt dirt riding. It's not necessarily dirt biking, I guess. So <laughs> dirt riding Versus like, street riding. I feel like I would I would enjoy dirt more, just because I I like being outdoors and stuff and and not not that you're not outdoors on yeah. your bike riding around in the streets. There's just I think it'd be really cool to ride through like a forest. Yeah, you have your own unique hazards with dirt riding. Yeah, or off road, just off roading. Yeah, cool. versus on road because you got freaking cars, but then you also got trees now. You got yeah, <laughs> you got giant rocks. Look sp- out for that bear! <laughs> yeah, or that tiger in <laughs> India. Um, no, I I liked that with when it came. I know my sports store wasn't designed for it, but I liked going off road. I like just just even those like little trails that are super easy. And just kind of going. Yeah, it gave you a completely different sense of riding a motorcycle because you've never ridden on anything like that. Yeah. And it was a totally different feeling. And there was probably a stretch of time there where you you enjoyed that way more than riding around town. Yeah, it sucked riding just to get there. And then after I filmed my Saturday Scrambler series, I just went home. Yeah. Like, I never rode. Yeah. yeah. No, there's, there's a – if it's on the right bike, it's probably a hell of a lot better. Which you weren't on. Yeah, I wasn't on the right bike. But yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. I think I'd rather do that. That's why we'll get hooligan and you get you take your FTR and then we load it up and we go there you go. riding. So the the uh Indian Scout hooligan kit is what he's talking about. Yeah. And I'm surprised that it is not his dream, dream bike. bike. Because he's been talking about it forever. So we're going to go to the images real quick. So the Indian Scout Hooligan Kit. There it is. That's And that's it's all, it's pretty much bolt-on, right? I mean, yep. he obviously has extra stuff on it. But if you go to his thing, I mean, that's what it is. Yep. So you take a Scout or a Scout 60. And it comes with uh, a new subframe for the rear end. Um, with a new seat and then it'll come with um, bars and it'll come with you know it comes with number plates and stuff like that kind of just to give you a decent look to it but um, they come with mag wheels from the factory and I'll put spoke wheels on oh, crazy it. horse comes tires with one. yeah that one is really cool they have a new tank Is that a new tank uh, they no but they could have customized that they could have cut it out and yeah welded, you know insert in there but yeah, that's that's what I want. It's got some, you know, moto bars and it's an off-road vibe. The hooligan um races are are man, those dudes are wild. So they'll take these things. It's a group of like 8 of them and they'll take them on the track and they just they go to town. So um that that's uh that's going to be the next one. I'm, that I'm that looks that fun. That one looks fun. Yep. And it'll be off-road capable so I can go have some fun and and then we both can ride. Yep. So imagine that in my FTR. 
I think that'd be bad ass, boys. That's what Matt's doing. That's yay. what. <laughs> yay! <laughs> so if you'd like to, I don't su- know when. <laughs> if you like, <laughs> if you'd like to support Matt's dream bike, there you go. Uh, please sign up on the Patreons and super chats. Uh, every super chat we do with after the ride, we're gonna split and then uh, probably start drinking beer. So it's up to you guys yes. if you wanna. You want to do that? Support our beef jerky addiction and uh, some beer. So the beer will be on you if you do super chats. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So I put, ask your questions. It's Q and A time, and I'm starting to look. And we're gonna answer these questions, whether they're joke or not. <laughs> but uh, are there? So one minute to midnight. Asks, are there any jet skis that look like motorcycles? Water would be fun to drive in. You you've been on jet skis, right? I've been I've, on jet I've skis. I'm trying to on, picture one that looks like a motorcycle. <laughs> I've never been on a jet ski, honestly. I've only been on boats. Oh. So, well, I mean, like, when I asked you, like, when, when I first started riding, I, I I tell this is, like, my story thing is that I remember asking you, hey, I like riding a bicycle. Is riding a motorcycle anything like that? You're like, yeah, it's a lot better because you don't have to pedal. Yep. So, is that like jet skiing? It's a lot, it's a lot like motorcycling, but you're on water? I mean, it's really it's similar. Yeah, because it's sure. the handlebars and yep. all that stuff. You it's, got you got the clutch front brake. No, I'm just you don't have the same kind of control. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's not like you're gonna smash the brakes on your jet ski. Like, you know, it's uh, yeah, you, you watch you, out, you're gonna loop you get it. off the throttle, yeah. and and that's is that's about it. Um, some that look like motorcycles are most. You know, I feel like the stand up the stand up jet skis would be. Re- you know, I, I've been on one, and that might be that might be really close. Um, if you're trying to straddle something, obviously that's not going to work because you're you're standing up on that one. But as far as agility goes and stuff like that, man, I think I think it's real close because those are really agile. And then nowadays these uh, jet skis are getting so large; they're they're huge and they're tons of power. There you go, buddy. <laughs> and uh, oh, sh- there you go. It's an amphibious jet ski right, man. motorcycle. We're done here. The Bisky. It's a bicycle jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, that looks badass. Well, the quad ski. Whoa. Whoa, that looks dangerous. But yeah. Look how hardcore that guy looks. Yeah, that dude's really hardcore. Yeah. Um so yeah, the bisky. Moving <laughs> 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 on. Um jeez. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, oh man, <laughs> there you go though. There we go. There you go. The biscuit found it. We yep. did it. So Tinker's asked any recommendations on helmets that do sunglasses, comms, and lots of vents. Uh, there are helmets with that that drop down, the inner visor. The majority of full face or modular helmets have those now. Yeah, have drop down visors. So a drop down visor will help you out with your sunglass issue. The comm system, uh, you just get a pack talk slim free comm or any type of Bluetooth. They they don't stick out very much. The only, I mean, Scala makes a uh, makes a helmet that comes with, you know, obviously that that system. There's not a lot of helmets out there that'll come with the system. Yeah, but um, every every single helmet made, I think, can be retrofitted with whatever system you yeah. have. For the venting, you're just gonna have to just keep testing, trying out different helmets. So what I would do with that is just to look for a helmet that has the the insert and then look for a helmet that is comfy and has a lot of vents and then you can always add a comm system afterwards. Does your Shoei have a lot of vents? It has it has uh like two or three. It's it's not Is it not enough? It's it's almost not enough. But it never bothered me. I'm so used to having like full gear with the SCBA on, sweating my ass off though. So. Yeah. To me, it's not a big deal, but I know a lot of people don't like having any sweat whatsoever. I'm sure there's some helmets out there with a ton of ventilation. Oh, yeah. That's why I like the bullet so much is because it had a ton of air. Flow. It did, and it, yeah. but it made all my videos like sound like there's a wind turbine flowing through. Yeah. So if you really want it to be quiet inside, then, you know, there's helmets that are better catered for that. If you want a lot of, you know, circulation, then there's a – that Bell Bullet has a lot of circulation, almost – to where, yeah, if you were trying to listen to music or talk uh, on a system, it, 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 a lot of interference. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. A lot of noise in there. Um, all right. So, Asteris, what's your overall opinion on BMW as a motorcycle? Aesthetics, reliability, mechanical, et cetera. I don't have really a, an opinion on it other than the aesthetic portion. I really like the R9T. Mm-hmm. I like the way it looks, but I have no idea 
I just, I mean, I don't like the whole, the engine, how it sticks out and all that stuff. Yeah, it's like just so wide. Boxer motor. Yeah, it's all wide. Um, You know, there's some BMWs out there that have been, that have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles. So they're probably fine. I don't own one. Um, I've been around them a lot. And then, so as far as reliability goes, I mean, yeah, I think it's just like anything else. They wouldn't be in business if their bikes were total pieces of shit. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you true. know, they, they. They're probably fine as long as they're taken care of. I know that some of the services are pretty complex and they need, they require a lot. And, and that's typical, I think, of a lot of, um, you know, like, like Ducati and Triumph and BMW and stuff like that. Um, aesthetics, they're, some of them are really, really cool looking bikes, like really cool bikes. Um, even the sport bikes, and I'm not a sport bike guy, but that S, you know, SS1000RR or whatever yeah. it is, that thing looks wicked. Um, super so low, they're super yeah, low. Yeah. So aesthetic wise, I yeah. think they're fine. I, th I think they look great. I think they're cool bikes. Um, reliability. I mean, yeah, like you said, thousands and thousands. Yeah. Mechanical. Some, some, but just like anything else, I mean, these things are man-made. So, I mean, they might, they'll, they break, um, just like, you know, yeah. anything else. But I think it, it really depends on, are you looking at a brand new one? Are you looking at a used one? What, you know, what kind of shape is it in? How many miles with, you know, do they have? Um, I think BMW has done a pretty good job as a motorcycle company over the years. And I'm sure that, you know, just like everybody else, reliability is, get, is better than it used to be. Um, mechanically, hopefully a lot of these companies can start building motorcycles that, that don't require so much service. And I think Ducati is getting there. Um, you used to have to do a valve adjustment every like 3000 miles. Holy on crap. Or something like that. And now they're not so bad. So, um, to be completely honest with you, I don't know certain intervals of BMWs and what they require, but I think, I think if you were to buy a brand new BMW, uh, I, I think mechanically and reliability that they're probably okay just as long as you take care of it cool cool hopefully that answered any of those questions <laughs> um clab says have you thought of or have you thought or considered electric bikes or hybrids um i know i don't i kind of know i read a little bit about the uk banning petrol engines in the future like it's actually on the books and they're gonna be banning petrol so that could be a huge thing when it comes to motorcycles. So I think the I think that's why Zero has been pushing a lot in in the UK. But um, I think they're cool. I really do think they're cool. I just think the price point for what I would use it for is just not there. And the infrastructure of if I want to go a long distance, it's not there at all either. Um, but I think they're pretty cool because the depending on the range and how far you drive to work. I mean, you drive to work or you ride to work, you come home and plug it in, and you're not riding anymore, and that that's it. Yep. And if you have solar, then you're good, yeah. you know, with all that stuff. So I think they're pretty cool. I've never seen – I haven't seen a hybrid. Is there a hybrid one, like a electric slash I – I don't think I've ever seen one. Or I don't think one. so, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't think so. Victory used to make a, an electric bike. It was called an Impulse. They made it for a couple of years, and it was 20 grand, and nobody bought it. And then – 20 grand, and nobody bought it. Yeah. There's going to be three people that are going to buy the – Harley Davidson Livewire. The Livewire looks grand. cooler. It's thirty. Livewire looks way cooler, and it's Harley. So there's gonna be there. They'll sell. They'll sell a few of those just because it's Harley and people <laughs> have too much money. Um, but they'll they'll sell those. It's not suitable for what I would use. You know, it, it, in order for me to spend that kind of money on something, first of all, I, I probably won't. No, but that's thirty grand. It'd a have lot. to be a lot less, and it'd have to have way more, way more uh, range. You know, and yes. I'd have to have like some sort of quick charge to where I could ride. Uh, you know, 200 miles and then, and then I, it's a quick charge for a half an hour or yeah. you know, something like that or 120 miles and it's a quick charge in a half an hour. I'd be okay with that because on a scout, you know, you ride 120 miles and then it's time to get off and get fuel. So, yeah. So, I mean, the zero, um, is supposed to be like half the cost and have more range and better charging. It looks half the cost too. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck! It doesn't look half the cost. Uh, no, some of them. Good. Some of them look cool. Some it looks of them good. Really cool. No, some I, of them look. I, cool. I would do a supermoto because I don't plan if I ever get a supermoto. Like, well, let's just say I get the DRZ four hundred. I don't plan on going like two hundred miles 
like maybe 50, 60, 70, 80 miles. If you get a DRZ, you're getting it for dual support purposes. Well, you're not going to supermoto it. Well, you're not well, put wheels you can put, okay, then the zero, the zero FX. The zero FX is their dual sporty version. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, that would be good with yeah. all the torque and everything. That you, yeah, you're you not worried too much about range at all, um, you know, on something like that where you're taking it off-road. So, I think electric would be really, really cool to own. I think it'd be sweet to own. Right now, there's no way I'm spending that kind of money Yeah, right. on any of them. Right now, I'm not doing that either. But, you know, let's say, let's say Harley kicks this thing off and it does really, really well and they're able to compete and zero can continue to do what they do because zero has been making bikes for a while now and they're yeah. starting to but i think they sell a fair fair amount of uh, electric bikes and then that price point starts to fall you know just like when technology comes out and then there's time um you know after a few years maybe five years maybe it takes longer for that that price to fall and start to get to a point where people can afford them um they'll take off they'll they'll take off so I would do it. I'd buy one. Yeah, sooner or later. I mean, hell, yeah. I'd buy the live wire if I had money to burn. Like, yeah, probably. Just might as well screw it. it. Let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. Um, all right, so we're gonna power through the last few. We got about five to ten more minutes left. So Alex Smith says, "Do you have any recommendation for aftermarket parts, or is it better to stick with OEM? Like, have you seen any like horror stories from people just like like putting on a clutch?" cable that shouldn't have been there there are horror stories for sure yeah yeah so yeah aftermarket <laughs> clutch cable will uh you know that could do some damage yeah um so um <laughs> like big bore kits people use different valve springs um, okay and if they're not the proper valve springs and they break in half now you get to spend like you know 1500 bucks putting that thing back together so um I will, it, it really depends on what it is. So if you're, if you're doing like internal motor components, um, for upgrades, if, if they offer it like from the factory, that's the direction I'm going. Um, so there are, uh, there are plenty of aftermarket places out there. Now, if it's just an exhaust pipe or something like that, the aftermarket world for exhaust is, is endless. Oh yeah. And, and uh, everywhere there are some aftermarket exhausts out there that are far and away superior and way cooler than OEM. Um, they sound better. They look better. Hell, they're probably less money. Some of these, you know, like an Indian exhaust system is pretty, you know, they get yeah. spendy where you can get a different exhaust system that has a, that has a better sound or, or a better look for maybe less money. You know? And then, so, I mean, sometimes OEM, you can't find what it is like, like a, like a tuner, like, unless you get it professionally yeah. dyno tuned yeah. and all that stuff. Um, shocks. I mean, there's no Indian branded suspension. Is there the shocks that Indian uses are Fox shocks. So Fox. Yeah. So that would probably be the OEM then like that's their, I like mean, the recommendation. Fox. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. So they they don't say Indian shock. Nothing. On them. So oh, okay. some do. So so Indian. So scouts have a shock that say Indian on them. Um, but Fox. So the uh, the big one on the Chiefs are Fox shocks. Um, you know, and then they obviously Fox makes suspension for everything. So yeah. you could go that route too. But I mean, suspension wise, there's a lot. Like you go Olin's. Yeah. Like Olin's. Yeah, I got Olin's on mine, and and. Uh, I don't know if they're Olin's. They're they look Olin's. like Olin's. They're Olin's. I don't know if they are. I think they're. I'm pretty okay. sure. We go with that. I'm pretty sure. Fuck, now I gotta look. I don't know um, what they are, but I'd be shocked if they're Olin's and they're not branded. Indians got. Ah, whatever. I'll look it up later. Anyways, um, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then like a pro taper bar, so it's pro taper. It's right. not okay. That's what I'm saying. So if okay. Olin's, if they partnered with Olin's, then then uh, they would have put Olin's on there. Like your brakes, those are Brembo Brembo's, brakes. Yeah. They don't say Indian. So I don't think there's any signage on those on the suspension at all. So really, the things that you kind of want to stick with for OEM would be like like fuel or not fuel, but uh, uh, oils and stuff. Or no, you don't even have to do the oils. Just I mean, I would make sure you do it right. I would do internal motor components. I would do OEM. Yeah. So if they make like a big bore kit, I'm doing a Indian big bore kit versus you know Jerry's big board kit jerry's big board you know what i mean like there's some stuff there that i just don't flat out trust because yeah. i've seen i've seen some really 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 bad things happen with guys who put things on their bikes that are aftermarket that just aren't right yeah so but there's there's a lot of aftermarket stuff that i'm doing 
hands down. Like yeah. the Sportsters we built were all, were was, all they were not Harley parts yeah. at all. No, yeah. They're not OEM parts at all. And there's and no we were way. doing it. <laughs> yeah, and they were awesome. And they were way Hell cooler yeah. than if we yeah. were went and said, let's open up the Harley catalog and buy this. You yeah. Know? But Harley's a bad example because they're expensive. Well, there's some there's so much aftermarket out there for Harley. So there's 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 so many cool things aftermarket wise for Harley. Well, yeah, for for me and for instance the FTR, uh, right away there was a bunch of aftermarket. Well, not a bunch, but a, a, quite a bit of aftermarket. But it was OEM stuff. It was from Indian. Yeah, they they made a lot. They they made a lot of stuff. They and learned. Then there's nothing that was third party until just now starting to trickle in. Like, yeah, no. So they learned from when they came out with Scout. Because they released Scouts. They had some issues getting the bikes to the dealers anyway. But when they released it, there was no parts available. <laughs> like you can buy shit for them. <laughs> and so this time around, when they came out with something, they made sure they had stuff ready to rock. So, a lot of people were buying that stuff, too. Oh, I've been seeing pictures. Yeah, we put uh, spoked wheels on a, on a race replica uh, oh. last week. And they look it looks cool. It looks nice. Really cool. Yeah. He got a nail in his tire, though. So that's uh, cool. But he oh, just yeah. had to replace his tube. So. Oh yeah, because you have to have tubes with spokes. Yeah. But yeah. the spokes look nice. Spokes look sweet. Yeah. I'm a big spoke guy, so I uh, if I had the opportunity to put spokes on anything, I'm putting spokes on it because I like the look. Maybe one day I'll be able to afford spoke tires or spoke rims. That'd be great. The mags are cool though too. Yeah, so you yeah. Don't have to worry about a lot it's, of stuff. It's a want, not a need. Yeah. Um. All right. Oh, so Alex Smith meant for performance wise. <laughs> well. Uh, I mean, you can find really good performance OEM, and then a you lot can find of really cool. good performance. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what kind of performance, though. If you're just looking like exhaust and intake, you can go. I'd go aftermarket all day long. Yeah, but if you're looking for like major, major, major motor work, I'd probably do OEM. Yeah. So, Chief Lucifer, uh, when you're ready to upgrade bikes, how do you decide if it's too much bike? Um, when I think of upgrading a bike, I think of like changing up how I ride too, because I get I've I've been on the Sportster since I got it in November 2011 until recently, and I almost wanted to change how I rode. So I wanted to get like a dual sport. I wanted to get something that could go longer distance. I wanted. I mean, but then the FTR has cruise control. I can go off road if I want to. I don't have to go off road. It has traction control. It has everything I wanted. So it's almost like a jack of all trades situation. Um. So when I think of upgrading, I think of like changing what I do. Um, but a lot of people think of, well, if I got a Ninja 300, I got to go to the Ninja 600 or whatever. I got to go stay within the same sport bike family. I mean, I would say broaden your horizons and keep going, but how do you figure that out? Like, how do you know when you're ready? And then how do you decide if it's too much bike? I mean, if you're already thinking, you know, I'm going to upgrade my bike. I feel like I'm pushing this <clears throat> bike to the limit or I, the way I ride is keeping in the rev limiter and all this other stuff. It's not good. I need to upgrade then that's kind of how you should decide. Yeah, I mean, if you already feel like your bike, you wouldn't be thinking this way and unless you thought your bike wasn't enough bike. Yeah. And so at this point, you feel like you need more. So there's a, uh, um, but you don't want to, I don't think you want to jump from a, you know, Ninja 300 to, you know, a leader bike. You know, you don't want to, I don't think you'd want to do that. So there's um, the, the, the interesting part about, you know, those leader bikes, you can't ride that thing to its capability. To no, its full capability. you're like in second gear all day. No, you that's can't it. do it. So, um, you know, that's probably way too much. So, um, you know, you got to do some research, watch reviews. Um, you know, there's so much information out there on, spe you know, specifically YouTube that you can show. Um, they, they can show you, you know, just what those bikes are capable. And if you watch it and you go, oh, shit. I don't need that. Then it's probably too much, yeah. you know, or you go sit on it, go to the dealership, you sit on it and it's huge. And you're like, Oh my God. Um, uh, you know, you know, you have a good feeling when you do that. What, what exactly you're after. And then you go sit on something smaller and you're like, man, this feels great. And that's probably the one. So, yeah. um, yeah, that, that, that feeling, the whole CC size feeling. thing. That's a huge question. Everyone's like, what CC should I get? Is 600 too much for me? I'm a beginner. Should I start with a 125? Depends like on I'm, what kind of bike it is. Yeah. So if it's a sport bike and it's a 600 cc, that thing will flat out kill you really fast. Where if it's a if it's a cruiser and it's a 600 cc, still kill you, but it'll be slower. Yeah, it's all different. Yeah, the 500 cc Rebel, um, it's not like I mean I rode a, a 300 Ninja, and it was f way faster than the Rebel 500. 
yeah. um, in terms of turning the throttle. Different motor, yeah. different design. They're, those sport bikes are built to do fast speeds. Yeah. And the cruisers aren't. You know, they you lay back and relax. So with the too much bike thing, I think if, uh, I mean, too much height, too much weight, uh, too much speed, like if you're just going to be in the uh, – uh, like in town commuting to work, like you said, the thousand CC, the leader bike, man, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're going to, it's going to be, you're going to be fighting the bike. You don't, you don't get out of first or second gear. Yeah. A scooter at that point is better. That's why they have scooters everywhere yeah. in, in main towns. Cause you don't have to do anything yeah. other than just the throttle. So, um, if you're just doing, if you're doing highway riding and commuting, well, then you're going to have to find something that is good for that. Um, but yeah, it's it's all it all, it's a huge question. Sitting on it, definitely. riding them are going to tell you a lot. Yep, they'll give you a lot of information. Demo days, do a demo day. Yep. So go. To yeah, a, there's plenty it. of people that come to demo days at our shop and they ride it and they're like, yeah, man, that's that's a lot. That's too it's much. Like I'm glad I came here and rode this because yep. I'm not buying it now. Yep. I mean, now they find something else. Yep. And so. you just cross that one off the list. Noise. Uh, interesting that he mentioned music. How do you? How do most of you listen when riding? I put in earbuds and turn up to 11. It probably explains my hearing loss. Um, I listen to music sometimes. Most of the time I'm filming, so I don't really I don't really listen to music very much. My voice is like a cross between Fergie and Jesus. So I just I just sing out loud when I'm on the bike and it's And then it just it's fills beautiful. in the fills the helmet. Yeah. And it's really shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut up. Psycho <laughs> Kitty Cat 11 is a good idea to buy a motorcycle. Before the MSF class. Um, Hell yeah. <laughs> no. I don't think it is. You bought your bike before you I even did. took the test. I, I did. Yeah. I did. And I, I think that was uh, not necessarily a mistake. How did it go? I, <sighs> yeah, it went fine. It went fine. Yeah, you're good, but, man. But when it comes to the – the way I look at that is that uh, – <laughs> shut up. The way I look at that is that I'm taking the MSF because I'm brand new to the riding. So you pick a bike and then you get you sit on the BRC one class on a different type of bike. You're like, man, I really like this bike. I wish I'd have got this bike. And but you already bought something before the class. Or you take the MSF class and you and you haven't even ridden your new bike. You're waiting till you get your endorsement. You're waiting till you do all this stuff and you realize you freaking hate riding. Yeah, that would suck. That would really suck. There's no 30 day return policy, is there? For a motorcycle? No. no. So I mean, you, you can return it. You'll just take a hit you would essentially <laughs> just be selling it back yeah yeah and, and you'll typically take a hit so yeah if uh if you're taking an msf course it probably means you haven't ridden or or much um yeah that's nice that you know you spend three or four hundred bucks at an msf course before you buy a bike and spend five thousand or ten thousand or whatever you whatever you do so it's um i don't know if it'd be a good idea so yeah you could take that course and if you hate it you don't have to buy a bike or you could just uh, buy a bike because you're probably not going to hate it. I wonder how many people go through MSF courses and say, you know what? I just hate it all of Well, that. Maybe, maybe not hate it, but I know there's been a few commenters saying that I took an MSF course and I feel like I need to take it again. Like I passed and everything, but I'm nervous. I'm That's su- a, it's okay to be nervous. Yeah. But that, that, that has nothing to do with them purchasing a bike. Though. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I tell them to, to just practice in a parking lot and stuff so you don't have to repay an MSF thing. Right. Um, but a lot of them might have bought the wrong size bike and they're nervous about dropping their bike because they dropped it three or four times in the class. Yeah. So maybe a used bike would be a better option or something with protection like engine guards, totally. radio oh, I mean, guards, there's, sliders. There's, bunch but, of different directions that you, yeah. that you can take but i don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing to buy the bike before the msf course no. unless you legitimately don't know whether or not you're going to ride like riding but i don't know anybody that's done it yeah. and says you know what it's not for me i think if you make the choice to buy the bike like you went through the whole dealership process you did all this stuff you took it home i think you pretty much know you want to ride yeah. Unless you just have a ton of money and you're you like, you could absolutely buy the wrong bike though. Yeah. You know, people buy the wrong bike all the time, you know, yeah. so um, trade it in six months later. Yep. Yeah. That happens. But I don't think it's a bad idea to buy the bike before the course. You know, you walk into the bike, you walk into the shop and you talk to a salesman and the salesman's, you know, some most, most salesmen hopefully are, are pretty honest and they, they give you the right information. At that point, you can really figure out, I really like the look of that bike. And, um, uh, and then you talk to the salesman and then he, st- he tells you about it. And is it a bike that you, that, um, 
that's going to work for what you want, you know, in the future, whether it's the next couple of years or next few years, or he steers you towards a different bike. That's a little more catered to what your goals and needs are. Yeah. yeah. And, and then if you, so if you do that and it works and, um, you've gotten the right information, um, yeah, then it's irrelevant. But if, uh, if you go in there and you, and you get steered towards a totally different bike, that's not catered to any of your needs, then that's a problem too. But you can do that. That could happen after your msf course too. yeah yeah, yeah. So, definitely can yeah. and another another cool thing is that some msf courses or uh the, the companies that run them because it's basically a, an independent contractor with you know the dmv and all that stuff long story short is that you can possibly get depending on what they have with the dealerships around there i mean you could get like some gear for free if you go buy the motorcycle yeah. after you show them your msf endorsement so you might be able to get a free helmet out of something, you know, if you're going to buy anyways. That's, but you have to definitely figure that out and check and see. Um, but for the most part, I think it's it's almost like like cutting before you measure. Like you're 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 pulling the trigger before you know. And for me, I don't I don't know if I could do that. When, I know some people can. When you know, you know. When you know, you know. Yeah, isn't that a thing? I don't know. I never know. I always second second (laughs) question myself all the freaking time. (laughs) I don't know. What's going on? (laughs) I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, and it's not necessarily, God, I mean, it could be a horrible thing too. So I don't don't know, man. There's a, if you make a, uh, you know, if you, if you write down what you, what the goal is for you riding a motorcycle and that bike checks off everything that you're after, then man, it, it's fine. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but definitely sit on a bunch of bikes. Don't sit, sit on, on them. Don't yeah. don't sit on the the bike, and you're like, man, I I really like this. The first, the one that you picked out because you watch all these YouTube videos and saw pictures, and you went there and you sat on that the first thing. And you're like, I love it. I think because then you haven't sat on another bike yet, and you're like, oh my gosh, this one feels so much better. I can yep. reach everything. So it might actually change for you. Yeah, that absolutely happens. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's a big deal that you sat on a bike and it felt good. Yeah. yeah. You know, so you, uh, you know, if you're shopping, if you're out shopping for a bike and you sat on a bike, you like the look of it and you like the feel of it, you sat on it and you're like, oh man, that feels good. Write it down, you know, or take a photo of it and then put it in an album. And then when you sit on another one, uh, take a photo of that one and then put, put that, that on a USB put drive, in put it in a safe in six <laughs> and then years. When see it's if time you still to buy like a bike. It. When it's time to buy a bike, you look at all the ones that you sat on and you felt that you loved, and then, oh, man, that one felt way better than that one. Just take that one off the list and then, uh, you know, sit on everything. Yeah. And then when you buy it, ride the shit out of it. Yep. That's the only way you're going to figure things out. I think that that question spawned into what's a good bike for me. Not necessarily. I don't even remember what the question is, to be honest. Um, but it morphed. Well, is it a bad idea to buy a bike before? There the you go. Sometimes? Okay. And no, it's not. It's not a bad idea. It may not be a good one though. But it may it's a lukewarm <laughs> idea. So you know. Um so anyway. <laughs> um so anyways, uh guys, uh that is the one hour live stream, the Q and A after the ride type thing. We call it after the ride because we used to drink quite quite heavily during these podcast live streams. Um I'm drinking a diet barks, but thank I, you, Casey and Robert, for the super chats because we have now beer money. We got ten dollars. Mm. We got beer money for I'm next under time. Under the very real assumption that the majority of folks would rather see us drinking and hanging out. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I actually ordered. Uh, uh, I got some chairs, so we're gonna have a different spot. We're gonna be more relaxed. So next time it's gonna be. Um, I don't want to say it's a lot like Revzilla's version, the high side, low side podcast that they have going on, where they're all on couches and a table. So it's gonna be like that kind of, but we're gonna be in chairs. Chairs. Some some comfy chairs, not these chairs. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I got a pad. You don't have a pad on yours. You've been sitting on your butt. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, we're going to be doing that. So if you guys want to see this stuff more, uh, just let me know in the comments. Uh, if you want to see it less, let them know in the comments also. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe like once every other week or every other week, bi-weekly. Depends on how wanted we De- are. Yeah. It depends on how wanted this is. Yeah. So just let us know. It's mainly just him because I'm here all the time. That's true. So if you want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah you can definitely ask him a bunch of questions he knows a lot about motorcycles i know the safety side he knows about pretty much the whole general of everything motorcycles everything else, everything else yeah. basically so i'm trying to encroach on that anyways 
Uh, I just want to mm-hmm. say thank you to once again Casey and Robert for the thank super you, chats. Casey. Thank you, Robert. If you would like to support the channel, Mandeline, she wants to see you. Your, your oh, wifey's. I gotta go. Yo, oh, you gotta go. Um, so if you want to um support the channel, swing on by Patreon or click that money symbol and become a, a YouTube member. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, join the Discord. Discord is absolutely free. This is the Discord right here. And every time you guys super chat, it does pop up. It pops up here. The Discord is free though, so you don't have to pay anything for that. We have fourteen hundred members. Uh, yeah, dude, it, it freaking went crazy. And if you want the link for that, uh, click that link right there, beginnermotorcycletips.com. It'll give you the link to the Discord, Patreon, my ebook, uh, ddfmcrew.com is a free training resource. So I mean I got a bunch of stuff for you guys. You made it possible by all the super chats and and the uh, Patreons and the YouTube memberships and sharing. But with that said, I think we're done. I think we're done. Cool cool. That was fun. Yeah. Well, it's gonna be more relaxed. Awesome. I'm gonna yeah. be drinking next time. I'm oh gonna, I'm cool. gonna have a beer next time. Thank God. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. There's Peace.